seems like every phone today has a wonderful little device called caller ID on there. There's a long history of that uh, invention. Uh, we eventually have to have a Brazilian uh, inventor to thank for that. Hold on a second. I'm going to decline that. My wife, she ought to know better. Like I was saying, most phones... Uh, caller ID, it's a great thing. We're able to look at our phone if you've got one of these fancy smartphones. Uh, if you still have that thing that's plugged into the wall, well, I don't know what to tell you this morning. Uh, we used to do that, kids especially. We had to, well, there was a thing in the wall called a telephone in, hooked on the wall, but uh, anyway, we had to go and answer it. But uh, all the smartphones now e equipped with the technology of uh, caller ID so that when someone calls us, it identifies who they are. And we can decide whether we want to talk to you or not. And that's, you do that, right, every single day with this if you've got one of these smartphones. You get, I don't know if you keep yours on vibrate or silent or, or you know, we've got different, uh, my wife has different ringtones for different people. I'm not going to tell you what she's got for my, my ringtone. It's got our, our, our love song that we, we had when we were dating. No, no. Oh, but uh, no. You don't want to know what it is. It, <laughs> she's got one for her sister, I think. She's, I don't know. She's got... Several. People have them for different people that they uh, program the different ringtone, a uh, tune, a song. Uh, ways that we can say, I don't really want to answer that call right now. Or we look at it and we say, we don't know the number. I don't think I want to, I don't think I want to answer this right now. It's a great device. It's a great invention. It lets us be more in control of our time, and our management of uh, what we want to do at the moment without just having to, you know, hello, who is this? And who, you know, who knows who it might be that we might be on the phone 10, 15, 20 minutes with. Caller ID. I want you to think about this morning. What if, what if God was on the caller ID? What would you do if, if, if you had a device that you could put on your phone or something that would pull up God's calling? God is calling. God wants, God wants to speak to you. God wants to say something to you. Would, uh, would you take that call? How often, rather, do you take God's call? I want us to look at this morning an incredible passage that is found in Genesis chapter 22. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in one, one primary passage this morning, Genesis chapter 22. You have your Bibles, church. Somebody said, I forgot to do this last week, so shame on me. Let's hold up our Bibles. We know what we want to hear is the Word of God this morning. Uh, in Genesis chapter 22, we have God calling Abraham. This is not the first time that the Lord has called Abraham in his life. But this will be one of his great calls, one of his great challenges that uh, tests that he will face in his life. It is a gut-wrenching passage. It is where the Lord calls Abraham to do the unimaginable, the unthinkable. Offer his son Isaac as a burnt offering. Let's go ahead and read it. I want to do this. It's a lengthy reading. Genesis 22, verses 1 through 14. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, Take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering. Moriah, on the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. Early, in, early on the next morning, Abraham got up, loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. And when he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, Stay here 
with the donkey while I, while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac and himself, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went up together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father Abraham, Father? Yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they had reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took his knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord cried out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up and there in the thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. It's just one of those gut-wrenching passages. It's just hard to fathom that God would even ask one to do this. And as parents, if you have a child, you, you put yourself in this situation. I know I've put myself in this situation thinking many times, thinking about this story. What I have done, what I have, what I have been willing, what I be willing to do, what Abraham was in the process of doing, to take his son and offer him as a sacrifice, a burnt offering to the Lord. I'd like to think that I would obey and do that. But I'm not so sure sometimes. It's just, this is a, a passage that really, really hits us as an incredible gut-wrenching story of a testing of this man's faith. There's something I want to note here in our story this morning as we think about this idea of when God calls and God calling us and when God's on the caller ID. Did you notice or did you three times in the passage that is read here, when God called Abraham, you have three times Abraham makes the reply, Lord, here I am. Here I am. Here I am. Three times his response to the Lord. Every time, in every instance that, that God called, when Isaac calls out, and then when the angel of the Lord from heaven cries out, Here am I. Here am I. Here am I. I want us to think about that this morning. I want us to look at these, this call that, uh, that Abraham receives. And I want us to first think about this first call, this first, the first here I am. There in verse 1, when God tested Abraham, He said to him, Abraham, here I am, He replied. God's call here was a call to test Abraham's faith. The, the, the text is clear there in verse 1 of Genesis 22. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. God tested Abraham. Abraham. I think the old King James it translates God tempted uh, Abraham. But we know that God doesn't tempt no one to sin. God is not inviting, is not soliciting Abraham to do evil. God is soliciting Abraham to obey him, to test his faith. A faith. Later on in Exodus chapter 20, Moses will, uh, will tell the people not to be afraid that God has come in order to test you or to prove you. Uh, God does that. God will test us. God will put us to the test. And He's doing that to Abraham here, calling him, calling his faith to put it to the test. During the wilderness wandering period, later on when, when you have that, that, uh, that period of God's people, in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 8, Moses tells the people there, or rather God tells the people that it was during that period of that 40-year wilderness wandering period that the Lord tells Moses He did this in order to put them to the test, to know what was in your heart. 
And that's precisely what the Lord is doing here to Abraham. He's putting him to the test. And really this is not so much about God needing to know, but Abraham needing to know that his faith is real. That his faith will obey God regardless of what God asks him to do. And up to this point, Abraham has passed every test, we might say, that God has put him to. Putting him to the test time and time again. And now in this, in this grand story here of uh, this call. You know, God calls us. God calls us, first of all, think about, He calls us through the gospel. God calls us to follow Him. Initially, He calls us through the gospel. 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 14 that God calls us by His gospel, that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the words of Christ, Romans 10 and and 17, Ephesians 1 and verse 13, that uh, in Him we trusted when we heard the message, the gospel of our salvation. That call comes through the word of God, through the gospel, through the message of Jesus Christ. And that's the message we're called to go into all the world and preach and to share. And so God invites all of us to to Him through the message of the gospel. But God, beyond that, when we respond to the gospel message in obedience and we become His followers, God calls us through the circumstances, through the events of our life, through His providential uh, working in our life. And again, God had previously called Abraham. Uh, You know how, if you know Abraham's story... You know that uh, when he was in the Ur of the Chaldees, God called him there at the end of, uh, of, of Genesis chapter 12 to leave his homeland, to go to a land that God would give him. And Abraham responded. The Hebrew writer would say that by faith, Abraham, when he was called, he obeyed. And it's literally there that as God called, Abraham started to move. God called, Abraham obeyed. He responded. And God put Abraham to the test. We know the promise of a son that Isaac and or that Abraham and Sarah would have a, a son who would be a blessing to all people of the earth. That God would make a great people out of Abraham and his descendants. But Abraham didn't have a son. he didn't have a child. He didn't have a son. And it took over twenty five years for God to work that plan to to test Abraham and Sarah. Would they trust God? Or would they try to do things on their own? Would they try to devise their own plan? Would they really trust God? And at the point of of Sarah's life, 90, and Abraham now almost 100, there's no question, there's no doubt at all, as they are beyond having children. But now the Lord tells them, now you're going to have a child. Remember he tells Sarah, Abraham, and Sarah's listening outside the tent, you remember, and she starts laughing, you know, that she's going to have a child in her old, old age. God tested this couple. He tested this man time and time again. God puts us to the test. In 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 6 and 7, I like how the English Standard Version translates this. It says, so that the, that the tested genuineness of your faith. Peter says you're going through some trials, you're going through some tribulations, you're going through some hardship, and the purpose of this is to see whether your faith is genuine or not. Is to be tested, tested the genuineness of your faith. And when God calls us through the events and incidents and circumstances of our life, He's testing our faith. And we want to be like Abraham that say, we say, Lord, here am I. Lord, I am, I am ready. I am ready and willing to obey and to respond to you. You know, God calls us, He calls us to be lights in a dark world, Philippians 2 and verse 15, that we would shine as lights in a perverted, crooked generation. God's calling you and I to make a difference. He's calling you and I to to shed the gospel light to a dark world. And our world, wherever your world is, and wherever you work, wherever you live, wherever you go to school, God's calling you. God is testing you. God is wanting to see whether we will obey Him and serve Him and live for Him. And that is a test that uh, we all have to be put to and will be put to by the Lord. We'll have trials, we'll have obstacles, we'll have challenges. And God wants us 
uh, so that our faith would be, be strong and real. And he puts us to that test. He put Abraham to the test, testing his faith. But secondly, we have a second call here. It's the voice of Isaac. And this was a call for Abraham. Isaac's call was for Abraham for understanding. Remember as this story unfolds and Abraham gets up the next morning, he immediately goes and does what and is going to do what God has called him to do. He takes Isaac, his son, he takes two servants, he takes the firewood, he takes everything he needs for the, uh, uh, to make the sacrifice and to make the, uh, the offering to God. And you notice as they're traveling down the journey, as he tells the two servants to stay here when they come to the place, that he and his son will go over there and they'll worship and they'll return. It says there down in verse 7, in verse uh, 7, Isaac spoke up to his father, Abraham, Father, yes, my son. Some translations use all three. Here am I. Yes, here am I. The fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Isaac's putting things together at this point. We don't know how old he is. Uh, I think he's probably a little older than a, than a child, as often is the picture depicted. But uh, nonetheless, he's a young, uh, a young man or young, a, young, a younger uh, 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 boy, uh, if you will. Uh, not, not an adult, but uh, uh, maybe not the, the little child that we often think about. But he figures some things out here. Where is the... We have, the, uh, we have the fire, we have the wood. Where is the lamb? Where is the lamb to make the offering? And you know this Abraham heard this question and looked at his son Isaac that he loved. And he says, the Lord will provide, my son. The Lord will provide. But this voice, this call to Abraham here was a call for, for understanding. Isaac needs understanding. He needs some help understanding this. What are they doing here, Father? What's, uh, where is the lamb? Where is the lamb for the offering? You know, God created the family, and He provided everything that the family needs. He created the first home in Genesis chapter 2, uh, and God gives us the provision of the family. All of the blessings, all of the, uh, as husbands, as wives, with our children, with our spouses, as grandparents, the extended family, God has given us that blessing of family, and Family is there to help each other. And that's what Isaac needs from his father now more than ever. He needs some help. His faith needs some, some help. He needs some questions uh, that need to be answered here. And so that's what he's wanting. Father, where's the sacrifice? We've got the wood, we've got the fire, we've got the knife, we've got everything we need. Where is the lamb for this, uh, to make the sacrifice? And again, Abraham says, the Lord will provide. I don't believe Abraham knew exactly how the Lord would provide. I think we do a, sometimes a great disservice to Abraham's faith when we jump over to Hebrews 11 and we read Hebrews 11 back into Genesis 22. Let me tell you something. Abraham did not know it was a test. He did not know it was a test. This is real. And God is asking him to take his son and do this. And, and we, 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 we undermine Abraham's faith when we say, well, the Hebrew writer says that he had reckoned that God could raise him from the dead. Abraham is wrestling with all of this. He's grasping, trying to figure out, how can I have this son that's going to be a blessing and be, a, uh, 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 be the foundation for a, uh, for a people, for, for all these descendants that we're going to have? How can, how can this be if, if God's asking me to kill my son now? I mean, Abraham is wrestling with all of this. This is a test. He doesn't know it's a test. And uh, Abraham, no doubt, uh, had, to, uh, had to grapple with this. But his son Isaac has questions he needs answered. As a parent, you've been there if you have children. Kids have questions all the time. And sometimes we don't even know how to answer their questions. We just have a little bit of information. We just have enough we can give them. We're not sure how everything is going to play out. Uh, I remember when Maggie and I, uh, when we, ex we accepted the, the offer, the opportunity to come here to Crosstown uh, back the middle part of January of this year, we, uh, I didn't do that. All right. Uh, I wasn't trying to get all sentimental or anything or change the mood. Uh, 
But uh, we, well, we sat down and we, we, we told our children that we were, uh, we were going to be moving Shawnee from Shawnee and coming to Tulsa. Uh, they had a lot of questions, a lot of questions. Where are we going to live? What school are we going to go to? Uh, and this and that. And Maggie and I many times had to say, well, we're going to live somewhere and you're going to go to school somewhere. Uh, we didn't have the answers to the questions. And as a parent, there's nothing worse than being sometimes in those moments when you're not, you're not even sure what to tell your kids. And Abraham, it's almost like that's, that's all he can hold to is that the Lord will provide. He will provide somehow, some way. And I know the Hebrew writer does say that he even reckoned in his mind, if God has to raise this boy back from the dead, he'll, he'll do that if that's what it takes. You know, as parents, that's our role that God has given us is to help our children along in their faith. God calls us to that. You know, in Deuteronomy chapter 8, 11, parents, this is a good verse. Deuteronomy chapter 11, notice what is, what is said here about the development of faith that God calls us to, uh, to have the role with our children. Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 18 and 19. Fix these words of mine in your hearts, and minds, tie them as symbols on your hands, and bind them on your, fo- on your foreheads. Teach them to your children, talking about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. I mean, you f- find this several times in the Old Testament, so that you can teach your children. Your children are going to have questions. Going back to when God called them out of Egypt and, and delivered them out of slavery... They established the Passover meal. One of the things that's stated there in the text of Exodus 12 is when your children ask you these things about this. Children have questions. Children need guidance. Children need direction. Children need influence. Mom and dad, that's, that's you and I. God calls us to, 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 to that role. Parents, Proverbs 22, 6, train up a child in the way he should go and when he's older he'll not depart from it. Ephesians 6 and verse 4, Fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. Fathers or parents, both of us, both we would say, mom and dad, specifically there to the father it's addressed. That's our role. God calls us to that. Children are wonderful. They give us great joy, but God has given us those precious children for a short time so that we can train them, we can influence them, we can be an example for them, we can one day give them back to God. And that's what we're preparing them for one day, that they will choose to serve and love God and live for the Lord and be a blessing and bring glory in their life to to God. That's why God has given us those children, not to be their friends necessarily, not for our children to like us even, We have those children for a short time to mold, to influence, to shape, to give them direction. And that's what God calls us as parents. Every every research I've ever seen in recent years about church and youth ministry, it shows without question that the biggest factor in whether our children will be faithful followers of Jesus Christ is not the size of the church, not how good the preacher is, Not how great the youth program is. All of those things can be helpful. Every research I've ever read shows and points back to one thing as the primary explanation. Whether kids will love God and follow God. It's they saw it in their home. They saw it from their parents. They saw it from a mother. They saw it from a father. And that's what God calls us to as parents. Isaac had had a question. He had some questions that needed to be answered. Abraham didn't know all the answers. He was going to help guide and mold and lead his son. Here am I. Here am I, son. I'm here for you. And then the third call is heaven's call. As he lays Isaac on the altar, as he's preparing to make the sacrifice, it tells us there, there in verse 11, as he is raising his knife, as his knife is is lifted up, And he, without question, is going to do what God has called him and asked him to do. He raises his his knife up. He hears the voice from heaven. He hears the angel of the Lord cry out. 
Abraham, Abraham, here am I, replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do, do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God, because you have not withheld your son, your only son, from him. Abraham, when heaven called, Abraham was in the process of obeying God. He was obeying God when, when heaven called him. You know, that doesn't always happen that way. There's other encounters and stories in the Bible that when God called at certain times, people were not found obeying God. God called upon Adam and Eve on one occasion. Remember that in the garden? After they had eaten from that fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, remember where they were at? They were hiding. They were hiding from, the, from God as though they could. Remember one time when God called King Saul through the prophet Samuel to go and destroy the Amalekites? And you remember when finally, when Samuel the prophet does arrive and he has to confront King Saul because Saul, he thought he had obeyed the Lord. And old Samuel, the old prophet, comes in and says, you know, what is that I hear? I hear the the sheep, I hear the animals, I see the king that's been spared. Oh, the people. And, you know, Saul begins to justify and rationalize, you know. The the people wanted to keep the, the best of the animals to make sacrifice and And, you know, he's pushing it off on the people, not taking responsibility. And he even initially tries to claim he has obeyed. And Samuel says, you have not obeyed the Lord. You've not obeyed God. Let me tell you something. Partial obedience is not obedience. It is disobedience. And that story, more than any story, teaches us that. But when heaven calls, we want to be obeying. Jesus said on one occasion in Matthew 24, 46, Blessed is the servant whom the master will find doing when he comes. And that's that's it. We want to be doing the will of our master. We want to be working while it is still while it is still day. When night comes, when no one can work, we, we, we think about. One day heaven will call. It'll call. It'll call you. It'll call me. And What we need is confidence so that we are ready for that moment. I think about in 1 John chapter 2. At the end of John's epistle, towards the end of the the New Testament, in 1 John chapter 2, he talks about when Christ appears. And John gives encouragement there that this is not going to be an experience and a time when we'll have shame when Christ appears but a time when we'll have confidence and we'll approach it in confidence. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 28. And now, dear children, continue in Him so that when He appears, we may be confident and unashamed before Him at His coming. Why are we going to be unashamed? Why are we going to have confidence when Jesus comes? Because we're doing His will. We are doing the Word of God. When heaven comes calling one day, we're going to be found obeying. You know, we... In 1 John, earlier in chapter 2, he tells us to not love the world and everything that's in the world. He says the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. It doesn't come from the Father, but of the world. And then he says in 1 John 2, 17, the world and its desires are passing away, but he who does the will of God abides forever. Let me tell you something. The only thing that's going to matter on the day of judgment, the only only thing that will matter is am I doing and have I devoted myself to the will of God? All of this stuff that we think is important, all of the things we spend all of our time doing in this life that we think is really going to matter, let me tell you, none of that will matter on the day of judgment. I'm just going to be honest with you. The only thing that's going to matter is the will of God. Am I in Jesus Christ? Have I been found doing faithfully seeking to do the will of God. And that gives a priority to everything we do. Everything we do, it it, it is subordinate, it comes under my first obligation is to do God's will. And everything else follows suit after that. You know, we sing a great, uh, at least we don't sing it so much, it's a a song that I remember hearing back in the, uh, when I was in the youth group, when I was sitting down here, like uh, our teens will often sit down front. Uh, Several know... From 10th and Rockford days, Uh, no, I I grew up at 10th and Rockford over in Tulsa over here. Uh, My youth minister was Davy Carter, and uh, he's a great, great man. Uh, 
but he was a great singer. And I remember the first time, basically, I heard this song, Someday. Remember, you know that song. Some of you know the song, Someday. It's not so, it's more of a quartet type song. I mean, youth can sing it pretty good, but it's not the best congregational sometimes. Uh, it's just, it can be a difficult song, but it's got different parts. Uh, the sopranos will, will, will say, someday, someday, and then the, al- uh, the tenors, the altos will come in, peace and joy and happiness, no more sorrow, someday. The tenor, and I remember Davey, he was a great voice, he can sing. Uh, he would, that tenor voice, that tenor lead, got to be ready when he calls my name, got to be ready when he calls my name. Got to be ready when he calls my name someday. And that, that I, to me, that gets me almost still every time I hear that song. God one day is going to call my name. He's going to say, Robert. And this life will be over. And I will be ushered into eternity. And I will stand before my Lord and my God and my Creator. And I will stand before Jesus Christ and I will give an account to my God. God is going to call my name. Guess what, friend? He's going to call your name too one day. Are you ready when He calls? Can you say and are you ready to say, as Abraham said three times, here I am. God calls, put Him to the test, here I am. His son calls, here I am. I'm ready to help. Heaven calls, he's found doing what God called him to do. Here I am. Are you ready to say that this morning? Are you ready to do more than just say? Are you ready to act upon that? Are you ready to put your faith in obedience, trusting the Lord? Maybe it's to come to Christ and put Christ on in the the waters of Christian baptism. I don't know if you haven't done that this morning, why you would leave here and not do that. To walk out of here and not be in Christ to put Jesus on in baptism, having your sins forgiven through the blood of Jesus, to live a a life that God calls you to live, to bring glory and honor to Him. Maybe you've done that as a Christian, but you've not been been taking God's call. You've been uh, seeing Him on the caller ID, so to speak, and you've been putting Him off. You've been ignoring Him. You know what you need to be doing as a Christian. Maybe there's something in your life specifically that you need to address, a spiritual need. Whatever we can do to help you this morning, we, we have this song for the invitation.